the skies above North Vietnam erupt into the fiercest air combat of the war. Brutal supersonic dogfights. As kills mount, one U.S. pilot pursues a life-or-death quest for a coveted title. The first Air Force fighter ace of the Vietnam War. Using state-of-the-art computer animation, you're in the cockpit with America's finest pilots as F-4 Phantoms challenge communist MiG-21s. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights. April 16, 1972. American combat forces have been committed to the fight in Vietnam for eight years. Today, four U.S. Air Force F-4 Phantoms, call sign BASCO, orbit 18,000 feet above Laos. The Phantoms are waiting to escort B-52 bombers into the heart of North Vietnam in a dramatic escalation of the air war. But there's been a mix-up. The B-52s are still on the ground and the Phantoms are burning fuel at a rate of 150 pounds per minute. To reduce drag, flight leader Fred Olmsted orders the Phantoms to jettison their empty centerline fuel tanks. Still, the reduced weight won't buy enough time. Phantom pilots know that there is, there is nothing that you can do in a Phantom to save that big, beautiful aircraft from burning all the fuel you got. We had to make a decision. Olmsted has two choices. Wait for the B-52s and risk running out of fuel. Or use their fuel for the flight's secondary mission, hunting for North Vietnamese MiGs. Olmsted chooses the MiGs, the Blue Bandits. He turns the Phantoms 180 degrees. Basco flight is now on the prowl. Flying number three is Olmsted's good friend, Dan Cherry. Fred makes a turn uh, and heads right for Hanoi. And we start pushing the power up and picking up the speed. And we cross that border into North Vietnam. Almost exactly at that precise time that we ingressed into North Vietnam from our orbit in Laos, my backseater picked up two blue bandits Basco Flight's audio transmissions were recorded, a remarkable historical record of air-to-air -air combat in Southeast Asia. Basco has two bandits on the nose, F-20. Copy that. Two bandits on the nose, F-20. Let's get rid of them, Basco. Two silver MiG-21s are 20 miles out and closing head-on at the Phantoms. Olmsted isn't backing off. He orders Basco Flight to stay on course. They march right down the radar scope from 18 miles to 12 miles to 10 miles to 8 miles. I didn't see them at the time, and Fred said, there's two silver MiG-21s there, Dan. And I said something really clever and smart like, where? MiG-21 there, Dan. Dan. Oh, joy. Two blue bandits just went by us. And that's when the fight really started. Olmsted and his wingman give chase. He rolls his F-4 Phantom into a climbing turn and swings around 180 degrees. Olmsted and his wingman are maneuvering to get above and behind the bandit into a firing envelope. Cherry and his wingman stay in trail, protecting Olmsted's six o'clock. Then, Cherry spots a third bandit, a camouflage MiG-21, ambushing Fred Olmsted from behind. We've gone through about 90 degrees of turn when my wingman, Greg Crane, spots the camouflage MiG right off of our nose. The North Vietnamese have set a trap, and flight leader Fred Olmsted is the target. The stage is set for a legendary dogfight. a battle on the cutting edge of a dramatic turnaround in the Vietnam Air War. 
Americans are in the skies above North Vietnam for the first time in three and a half years. In October 1968, seeking to de-escalate the conflict and bring the North Vietnamese to the conference table. Then President Lyndon Johnson declared bombing off limits above the DMZ, separating North and South Vietnam. The North used the bombing halt to build up its military capability. By 1972, they're ready for a major offensive. They stream hundreds of thousands of troops and armor down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They had massed approximately 200,000 troops there, north of the DMZ. That's 20 divisions, 600 tanks, and to put that in perspective, that's the same size, roughly, as the German army had during the Battle of the Bulge. In March, the North Vietnamese surged south across the DMZ. The fate of South Vietnam rests in the hands of American airmen. April 9, 1972. For the first time in the Vietnam conflict, American B-52 bombers cross the DMZ into the north. They pound supply lines and troop concentrations feeding the communists' advance. The gloves are coming off. In addition to dropping bombs, F-4 pilots have another mission, protect lumbering B-52s from enemy MiGs. I do remember the warning that was issued by the chief of staff, and he uh, said something to the effect that if any of you hotshot F-4 drivers let a B-52 get shot down by a MiG, you won't even be able to drive a taxi cab anyplace. To American airmen, the most dangerous aerial threat is the MiG-21. First introduced in 1956, the MiG-21, like its MiG-15 and MiG-17 predecessors, is renowned for its speed and agility. But unlike its swept-wing predecessors, the MiG-21 employed a triangular delta wing, an attractive design for a supersonic fighter, combining low drag and structural weight with excellent supersonic maneuverability. It was a Formula One racer, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, turned extremely sharp, it had a big afterburner, strong, a big thrusting afterburner engine. It could turn very, very quickly, very well. It was hard to see. No real, um, no real smoke, no smoking engines. The MiG-21 is armed with two heat-seeking air-to-air missiles and two 23-millimeter cannons. It's lethal in close encounters. In contrast to the sleek MiG, the massive two-seat F-4 Phantom was designed for the Navy in the late 1950s as a long-range fleet defense fighter. In 1962, it was adapted for the Air Force for both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missions. The Phantom was armed with four long-range radar-guided AIM-7 Sparrow missiles and up to four short-range, heat-seeking AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles. It could also carry up to 16,000 pounds of bombs, rockets, and napalm. Two afterburning J-79 turbojet engines make the F-4 a fast and versatile heavy hitter. Never, ever, ever forget what it was like to start those big old J-79 engines up and add just a little bit of power and feel that big old Phantom taxiing out and shaking and rumbling. You just knew you had strapped on a very, very masculine piece of equipment. It was massive. It looked like a combat plane. Capable of reaching speeds over 1,400 miles per hour, the F-4 is 100 miles per hour faster than the MiG. But the lightweight MiG, with its tight turn radius at high altitude, has the advantage in horizontal maneuvering, while the F-4's power has the advantage in vertical maneuvers. With American Phantoms and B-52s on the attack, North Vietnamese pilots respond aggressively they abandoned their traditional hit-and-run attacks. Now they turn to challenge the Americans. There's going to be blood in the sky. Fred Olmsted and his wingman are in the middle of it. 
they've fallen for a trap and chased after two silver MiG-21s. A third camouflaged MiG-21 has jumped on their tail. MiGs sometimes used camouflage paint schemes for this kind of mission. Staying low with camouflage made it virtually impossible to see when we're looking down in the jungle. The silver MiG-21s are here. Olmsted and his wingman are here. The camouflaged MiG streaks in on their tail here, but he doesn't see Dan Cherry right behind him on his six o'clock. Cherry and his wingman streak forward and engage the MiG. I rolled out, saw him, and just headed right for him. And he broke left and went right into a cloud bank. One in the cloud, Dan. Man, back to left. Okay, what in Going into a cloud in North Vietnam is a scary proposition. I'm thinking, man, I don't want to go in that cloud, but I was not going to lose this opportunity either. For American airmen in the hostile skies of Southeast Asia, an innocent looking cloud can be a death trap. Vietnamese radar operators can track the F-4s through the clouds to launch surface-to-air missiles against them. The F-4s can electronically detect a SAM launch, but can't visually avoid the missile. There's also the danger of mid-air collision. Cherry and his wingman know the risks involved. The American airmen are enveloped in a gray foreboding mist, but the F-4s press the attack. April 16, 1972. American airmen are in the skies of North Vietnam for the first time in four years. Dan Cherry and his wingman, Baby Beef Crane, have chased a MiG into the clouds. Visibility is zero, a fighter pilot's worst enemy. The pressure is much too intense. Cherry aborts. I couldn't stand it any longer, and I said, I'm not staying in this cloud any longer, MIG or no MIG. So I'd look all around, and my wingman confirmed his position. So the feeling then was, we've lost this guy. Suddenly, Baby Beef calls out. MIG, 2 o'clock, 4,000 feet above, climbing right turn. It's a lucky break. The MiG bursts through the cloud bank right in front of him. Oh, we're right behind him now. We're right behind him. We're right behind him. Cherry peers skyward. The MiG has lost speed in his climb. He's directly in Cherry's killing zone. Cherry pitches his nose up, trying to gain a missile bomb. His first MiG kill is right in front of him. Things seem to slow down in their motion to where everything became really clear. Cherry gets good tone. The infrared seeker head of the AIM-9 Sidewinder growls in the pilot's headset when it gets a lock on. Cherry strains to see the missile track. Nothing. He quickly launches a second Sidewinder. Again, no missile track. The missiles have launched, but Cherry doesn't know it. The MiG's high-G turn has defeated the missile's seeker head. I'm really angry. I mean, I, here's my whole life. I've never seen a MiG this close before. And I have this opportunity to get this guy, and I've got an airplane that's not going to work. Desperate, the MiG noses over into a spiraling dive. He's hoping that his tight turns will prevent Cherry from getting another lock on. Cherry and his wingman kick over into a diving chase. From 25,000 feet, the three planes hurtle toward the ground. The Americans have the weight and thrust advantage. Baby Beef has nosed ahead in the dive. Cherry clears him to take the lead, rolling to the outside, making way for his wingman. Beef can't use a heat-seeking sidewinder. The 
makes turning too tight. He knows it can't lock in a high G turn. He fires a radar-guided sparrow. Something's wrong. It drops like lead. Then he fires another one, and it does ignite, but it goes into a huge corkscrew out to the right. Then the third missile he fired, and it was tracking really well. And I thought, man, this is really looking good. Beef's third missile streaks through the sky. Another radar-guided sparrow. The sparrow tracks steadily on the descending MiG. The MiG breaks hard right. The 500-pound missile should follow, but it darts past without detonating. Cherry and Beef have fired five missiles. All have failed. It's a problem that's plagued the Air Force since the beginning of the war. Developed in the mid-1950s, the heat-seeking AIM-9 Sidewinder relies on infrared homing. First-generation Sidewinders are plagued with problems. They're prone to interference by clouds and rain, and often lock onto bogus heat sources, like the sun. With an effective range of two miles, the Sidewinder is best employed against short-range targets. Its long-range counterpart is the AIM-7 Sparrow, whose maximum range of 28 miles is far greater than the Sidewinder. Introduced in the late 1950s, the Sparrow uses radar instead of infrared. It must be actively tracked to the target by the F-4's backseater, the Weapons System Officer, or WISO. But the Sparrow is virtually useless against fast-maneuvering targets inside a 5,000-foot radius. During the war, there were over 200 occasions where someone fired a Sparrow missile, it never came off the airplane. Of the ones that did come off the airplane, the kill rate was 0.11. In other words, 11 out of 100 were victorious. The Phantom Air crews have another problem. Air Force fighter pilots, as opposed to their Navy counterparts, received little or no training on how to maneuver against small, fast adversaries like the MiG. What did I learn in my training about MiG pilots is a very simple answer. I learned virtually nothing. The experience we received in training was not against any dissimilar type aircraft. We only saw other fellow Phantoms with the same flying characteristics that we had. The most effective air-to-air -air training we had was done illegally. And we would go out and fly our bombing mission or our radar low-level navigation mission and save some fuel at the end and then fight with each other. So whatever skills we had when we went in there were developed by hook or crook. Thrust into his first dogfight against an actual MiG-21, Dan Cherry is on a steep learning curve. He races through his options. Two of his missiles have failed. But he's determined to kill the MiG. This is going to sound weird, but I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm going to ram this guy. That's the aggressive feeling that I had at the time, was that I was not going to let this guy get away. The MiG has lost airspeed in the turn. Cherry and Beef pitch up and roll vertical to keep from overshooting. As they descend once again on the MiG, Cherry calls for the lead. I kept telling Greg to get out of the way, and I'm in burner, and I'm trying to close on him because I'm ready to shoot. I'm ready to try to shoot. Cherry slides past Crane and fires a missile. Lo and behold, that big AIM-7 Sparrow comes out of there, and it does one of these kind of like a barrel roll maneuver like this at first. The Sparrow appears to be tracking off course, but then, to Cherry's relief, it rides the Phantom's invisible radar beam to the target. Its 65-pound warhead detonates ripping the right wing from the airplane. Cherry watches the plane plummet in a fireball. Go! 
From the flames, the MiG pilot miraculously appears underneath his parachute. Cherry roars past his vanquished opponent. If I made a little jink with the airplane to miss the MiG pilot and his parachute, we went up by him oh, well within 500 feet of him. And I remember clearly his legs sticking out straight like this and the black flying suit he was wearing, the black flying suit on. Dan Cherry has killed his first MiG. All right, you understand, you got a kill on him. But the fight isn't over. Ten miles away, Cherry's good friend, Fred Olmsted, is chasing down two enemy MiG-21s. He's in for the fight of his life. So right then, there's no doubt, we're going to have an engagement. We're going to have a, a very serious dogfight, and somebody's not coming home. April 16, 1972. F-4 Phantoms are dueling communist MiGs in the most intense dogfights of the air war. Fred Olmsted is on the tail of two MiG-21s. The enemies streamline their fighters for battle. I then remember distinctly seeing silver objects coming down in front of me and they pickled their centerline tanks. Then, unexpectedly, the lead MiG rolls inverted, diving earthward. And he was gone. He was out of the fight. That meant it was my airplane and my wingman against their wingman. Olmsted and his wingman are here. The MiG leader has just bugged out, leaving his wingman to fend for himself. Olmsted bores in for the kill. The lone MiG jinks down and into a left turn. A classic MiG ploy, he wants to lure Olmsted into a horizontal fight where the more maneuverable MiG can outturn the Phantom. Once I saw that turn, I was confronted with a choice here, whether or not to try and turn with him and get the gun sight on him or try and accomplish what I had learned in the past and I said, I'm going to fight this guy in the vertical. I'm not going to get out there and try and turn with this man. Olmsted pitches vertically, then rolls over into a dive. The move allows him to stay behind the MiG while keeping his airspeed up. He'll avoid a turning fight where his heavy Phantom will dissipate crucial airspeed or energy at a far greater rate than the lightweight MiG. It's an effective maneuver called lagging. I found that I could accelerate coming down because gravity was working for me, pull inside and use my increased energy to close the distance that way. Olmsted and his wingman repeat the maneuver several times. The horizon tumbles as the planes jockey for position. Losing sight of his attacker, the MiG reverses his turn to reacquire visual contact. But the reversal slows him down and allows Olmsted to close within missile range. Olmsted's radar-guided AIM-7 Sparrow gains lock. Olmsted fires. The missile streaks toward the MiG at twice the speed of sound and plows through the MiG's right wing. Incredibly, the MiG keeps flying. I don't know whether the missile only partially detonated or perhaps it was just the impact that absolutely sawed that wing off, but that's what I had. I had a MiG with about a half of a right wing and a spiraling left-hand turn at that time. Olmsted presses the attack. He fires a second missile. It doesn't track. Sparrow 3 armed. 
missile away. It hit him right in the top of the canopy, right through the canopy. And then I got a pure, absolute explosion because the airplane just exploded. It looked like two miniature nuclear fireballs, actually. And they just spiraled right down in front of us. Fred Olmsted has kill number two for Basco flight. What began as an aborted B-52 escort mission has resulted in two confirmed MiG kills. In 1972, the North Vietnamese have less than 60 MiGs in their Air Force. Thanks to Fred Olmsted and Dan Cherry, they've lost 3% of their fighters. On the ground, the determined North Vietnamese continue their offensive. In May 1972, the bombing campaign intensifies dramatically. B-52 sorties are doubled, from 1,500 in March to over 3,000 in May. F-4s are employed for bombing strikes and strafing runs against North Vietnamese infrastructure and troop positions. The massive new aerial offensive is called Operation Linebacker. There were much greater numbers of aircraft involved. It was a massive campaign that probably did more damage in two weeks than uh, the rest of the damage done in the entire war in North Vietnam. The strategic objective is to both blunt the North Vietnamese advance and to bring them back to the negotiating table in Paris there's a renewed sense of purpose among the American airmen, including Captain Steve Ritchie. After graduating number one in his flight training class, Ritchie served his first tour in Southeast Asia in 1968. He then returned to the States, where he became one of the youngest flight instructors in Air Force history. In 1972, he returns to Vietnam. I don't think any of us felt like we could sit here and live this good life here in America while our friends and our colleagues were back in Vietnam. Steve Ritchie racks up his first two big kills in the opening weeks of Operation Linebacker, one on May 10th, another on May 31st. Ritchie is proving himself a skilled dogfighter. As linebacker rolls on through June, Ritchie flies in support of dozens of strike missions. July 8, 1972. On routine combat air patrol, Ritchie will tangle with a flight of lethal MiG-21s and plunge into one of the most astounding dogfights of the Vietnam War. July 8, 1972. Pilot Steve Ritchie leads a flight of four F-4 Phantoms, call sign Paula, on combat air patrol over North Vietnam. As part of Operation Linebacker, the war's biggest bombing campaign, their mission is to protect B-52s from MiGs. On this mission, the Americans are able to tap into the enemy's command and control network, an intelligence coup that's driving the success of Linebacker. They could hear the controller that was talking to the pilot. They could hear what the pilot was saying. And so you knew where they were, what they're looking at, and where they're coming from. Steve Ritchie and Paula Flight are heading towards Hanoi. Suddenly, combat control crackles in his helmet. MiGs are in the air, somewhere below. Ritchie drops down to search for the enemy. He can't find them. They could be anywhere. Then another warning comes over the radio. I got a call indicating that they had us in sight and they were cleared to fire. And that information at best was about 40 to 60 seconds old. And we had no visual. So that, that gets your attention. If he stays straight and level, he's a sitting duck. Richie takes evasive action by making a hard right turn. 
the radio calls out another warning. This one is ominous. Two MiGs, two miles to the north. The MiGs are on Ritchie's 6, the killing zone, but he still can't see them. Ritchie's best choice is to turn directly into his attacker and try to get a visual. He banks left, stays in the turn, and swings 180 degrees head-on against the unseen enemy. His head swivels in the cockpit, scanning the sky. Visible for a fraction of a second, a MiG-21 flashes by at 600 miles per hour. We pass canopy to canopy about 1,000 feet from each other, doing about 600 miles an hour each, closing at about 1,200 miles an hour. Just subside. I could actually see the pilot in the cockpit. The pilots of the North Vietnamese Air Force were trained by the Russians and Chinese. Their skill level varied widely. Throughout the war, it was strongly suspected that volunteers from North Korea, China, and the Soviet Union were in the cockpits of some communist planes. Ritchie knows there's another MiG in the air. They've split up, setting a trap for him. The first MiG has streaked past Ritchie. If he turns to follow, the second MiG will be on his six, but Ritchie doesn't bite. He drops altitude and waits for the second MiG to show his hand. And he does. Now, Ritchie makes his move. He pulls into a hard left turn. 6.5 Gs plaster him into his seat. He strains to keep an eye on the second MiG. The MiG banks right, an unorthodox move. I was very surprised about halfway through this turn, after losing sight during the turn, to see the number two MiG in a right turn level in height. Most of us who fly fighter airplanes prefer to turn left and right. We prefer a left traffic pattern to a right traffic pattern. It's more comfortable to do this than it is this. The two planes are now angling towards each other in what pilots refer to as the high crossing position. In order for his missile to get a lock, Ritchie needs to get behind the MiG. He rolls to the inside, causing the MiG to shoot past him. Ritchie's now on the MiG's tail. It's a brilliant move. Ritchie pulls hard right out of the roll and gets a radar lock. It then takes four seconds for the radar to feed the information to the missile. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, which is a long time. Squeeze the trigger, nothing happens. It's another second and a half until the missile comes off the rail. Ritchie commits a second missile. Pilots often ripple fired the Sparrow because of its failure rate. First missile went through the center of the fuselage of the MiG, second missile went through the fireball. The explosion sends a wall of debris hurtling through the air. Ritchie's headed right for it. He rolls up to steer clear. It's too late. Debris punches into his left wing, gouging the skin. Ritchie clutches the stick. The big phantom shrugs off the insult. Ritchie firewalls the throttle. The fight's still on. His number four, Tommy Fiesel, is in trouble. He's got a MiG on his six o'clock. Ritchie is here. Tommy Fiesel is here. He's in a tight circling turn with a MiG-21 on his tail. The MiG's tight turning radius will eventually put him in a position to shoot down Paula Four. Ritchie sizes up the situation. He's going fast. If he engages too soon, he'll overshoot. The best time to get on the MiG's tail is when it's moving away from him and he can match its turn. Ritchie's number four and the MiG-21 pass in front. It's time. Ritchie pounces. The MiG-21 is now predator and prey. The MiG pilot sees Ritchie. 
He aborts the chase, breaks hard and down. Put the MIG in the gun sight, auto whack lock with the trigger on the left throttle. Immediate lock on, 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004. Squeeze the trigger. The 12 foot long Sparrow blazes off the Phantom. At 1200 miles an hour, the Sparrow rocks to the right and then, like a spear, it buries itself deep in the MIG's belly. In a stellar display of airmanship, Steve Ritchie downs two MiG-21s in just one minute and 29 seconds. Everything that I'd studied, learned, experienced, worked for for 30 years, all came together and gelled in an instant in time. So it was by far the most perfect mission that I was ever involved in. Paula Flight rejoins and heads for home. Udorn, Thailand. When they arrive, the celebration begins. Actually flew a couple of victory rolls over the field, which is kind of traditional. And we had a party at the club that night you would have enjoyed. Steve Ritchie is on the cusp of greatness. He has tied renowned veteran pilot Robin Olds with four MiGs to his credit. Richie needs just one more kill to join the coveted ranks of American fighter aces. But the quest could cost him his life. Steve Ritchie's double MiG kill on July 8, 1972 is hailed as one of the war's great dogfights. Now he needs just one more victory to become the Air Force's first and only ace pilot of the Vietnam War. There was a whole lot of attention because uh, the Navy had an ace, Air Force didn't have an ace. There was a lot of pressure. August 28, 1972. Steve Ritchie leads a flight of four F-4 Phantoms, call sign Buick. Their combat air patrol mission is winding down when he gets word of MiGs in the air. I was northwest of Hanoi, beginning to get low on fuel. Turns out MiGs were southwest of Hanoi and were being vectored back to Hanoi. As flight lead, Ritchie's Phantom is equipped with a little black box that makes a big difference in air-to-air -air combat against MiGs. The APX-81, officially known as the Combat Tree, or just Tree to airmen. Tree is an IFF, Identification Friend or Foe Transponder System. All military aircraft carry transponders that send and receive identification information to air traffic control and friendly planes. But TREE is unique. It can read the enemy's transponder. TREE-equipped Phantoms can tell if a blip on their radar is a MiG and shoot them out of the sky from miles away. We got the TREE contact way out. Two MiG-21s coming back, non-maneuvering. They're about uh, 5,000, maybe 8,000 feet above us. Started this climbing turn into the direction of them on the radar. Ritchie has used technology to get in position. But he must get a visual before he can fire. Under those circumstances, the cardinal rule is to never fire if there's any chance there could be a friendly in the forward firing sector. The aircraft hurtle in, their closing speed a blistering 1,500 miles per hour. Ritchie fires two missiles, but at these staggering closing speeds, the missile can't maintain radar lock. They streak away harmlessly. The MiGs take no evasive action. They're focused on reaching the sanctuary of Hanoi's anti-aircraft defenses. Ritchie must make his kill soon. The MiGs roar head-on past the climbing F-4s. Ritchie orders a left break, 
they swing around 180 degrees and zero in on the MiG's tail. I'm now supersonic, doing about 1.2 Mach. They're still subsonic. And I got a radar lock on, fired two missiles. The first one appeared to go by on the right side of the MiG. And he broke left which solved the problem for the fourth missile. The MiG's abrupt maneuver slows him down. He drifts into the Sparrow missile's effective range. The missile's warhead detonates on impact. Steve Ritchie becomes the first and only Air Force ace of the Vietnam War. The number two MiG in that flight of two did a wave down to the ground, and I elected not to uh, try to go after that MiG uh, due to fuel. And, you know, I've debated that in my mind many, many times over the years, whether or not we should have tried that. Ritchie and Buick flight head south for friendly airspace as word reaches the airbase at Udorn, Thailand. The Air Force now has an ace. We came in and actually did a little air show over the field. In this rarely seen interview, Steve Ritchie recounts the mission. Picked them up high at 11 o'clock uh, on almost a head-on pad, and from there uh, maneuvered into 6 o'clock and uh, fired uh, a few missiles and was lucky enough to get a kill. Operation Linebacker thunders on. The Paris peace talks resume in late August. The devastating air assault has taken a heavy toll on North Vietnamese transportation, oil supplies, and power generation. The North Vietnamese simply did not think we had the will, or our president had the will, to bring the force of our attack air down upon them. Miscalculated. On October 22nd, North Vietnamese concessions in Paris lead to a cessation of bombing strikes over the 20th parallel, but the talks break down again two months later. On December 14th, President Nixon sends Hanoi an ultimatum. Come back to the negotiating table within 72 hours, or the bombing resumes. There's no response from Hanoi. On December 18th, Operation Linebacker 2 commences and B-52s head north. 200 B-52s, half the Strategic Air Command, are committed to the fight. By December 29th, the big bombers have flown 729 sorties and dropped over 15,000 tons of bombs. The North Vietnamese returned to the negotiations, and on January 23, 1973, a peace agreement is signed. Thanks in part to Phantom Pilots, the war in Vietnam had finally ended. American airmen downed 193 MiGs in air-to-air -air combat against a loss of 89 of their own. Those of us out on the point of the spear, so to speak, very much rely on each other to get this job done and to survive. So we develop a, a very, very unusual uh, bond with each other. We had a mission. We worked the details of the plan ahead of time, and we executed it to perfection. And then to have the added bonus of a couple of MiG kills as well is pretty, pretty neat experience. Being a MiG killer is a life-shaping event, I would say. You feel honored to be part of a very, very elite group of fighter pilots going back to World War I, World War II, Korea, you name it. And the men that can claim to have won aerial victories and dogfights, an illustrious group. So it is an honor and a privilege to be part of that group.